Okay, good morning. Let's get started. So, you know, past the homework project over to the front, um, I still haven't graded the uh, exams. I'll get, try to give them on Monday. Um, and I haven't handed out the homework project for. Turns out I need to re uh, reinstall the kernels on all the machines. So, if you have anything stored on the machines that you need to store, um, take it off because I need to upgrade the OS and I can't hand out the stuff till I make sure that everything works and stuff. You had a question? Uh, I, just, I just have a random question. Yeah. We were searching online to try to figure out a good way to read in uh, hexadecimal from a file. Oh, I'm sorry? We were searching for, for, for this last project, we were looking for a good way to search in, like, bring in hexadecimal from a text file. Yeah. And we went to a message board with someone asking the same question, and their screen name was Chandra. <laughs> 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 Yeah, reading. Yeah, reading in hex. You know, you can do the formatting with a C, right? Zero percentage X or something. So, um, yeah. I mean, there used to be a time when there were very few Chandras, but now they are they are proliferating, right? <laughs> but but the, but the problem is they are not related to me because I don't know if I told you, but my last name is not really my last name because. We, we take the father's name, so um, you know, unless it's my father's kid, I won't be related to the last name. But you know, whatever, right? So, so the the, the next project, I, I'm going to briefly tell you like what what it's about. Um, and some of you asked for a way to get extra credit, and I think this is one important project where you can actually work and and, and do add new stuff because. Um, we will we we'll use a tool, tool called Fuse. I'm not sure how many of you used used it for other stuff. It lets you write user level file systems, right? So you can actually do write a file system, do interesting stuff, not necessarily mark with the kernel, but at the user level, and be useful to do something, right? So I'm I'm going to talk about doing something which is fairly straightforward, but you can do whatever you can imagine, right? Because the the Fuse is pretty powerful, and you can you can write the stuff, right? So I'll I'll briefly say what I would like. For you to do before actually going to the file system, because one of the things is you know files you probably have used all your life, so you probably have a little bit sense, you know, a little bit understanding of what what this look like, right? So essentially, for the project, I want you to write a disk simulator again, you know, uh, but in, in this case, you can actually interact with it, right? So the idea here is instead of rather than dealing with the real hard disk and mucking with the uh, you know make uh, details, you'll you'll Use a file, let's call it disk, right? So you will write and read from this file, even though it's conceptually writing into a disk, right? You can think of this as like, you know, this is your CD or this is your device, this is your disk, disk image kind of thing, right? If you use like Mac or something, you know this is a disk image or ISO kind of thing. So the way we're going to use it as a disk is to restrict ourselves to two operations which you will write, one is read block and write block. I'll specify what the semantics are in the, in the project. But essentially, which which let you only read in block size. You can't read a byte from anywhere, even though in, in C you could, right? In this file, you only read in a block or write in a block. So you you know, so if I say the block size is five twelve, you are only allowed to read or write blocks, and you have to keep track of which blocks are free and which blocks are being used. This is sort of like what you did for the memory memory systems, except it has to be stored in the files in this disk itself because you know when when the when a process dies. It has to keep track of all this stuff. So you have to have the free block stored. You have to have some kind of directory stored. We'll see what that is, what you know, what directories, how, how you would do that. But a simple system is, is okay for the basic uh, project. Right? So you have to have, you have to, let's say these are used for free blocks, these are used for directory blocks or something, where tell you where the files are. You'll design how the files are going to be stored, right? And and you'll write them using only the read block or write block, right? And and that's the component. For the base, you don't have to make it any complicated. No direct, no subdirectories and all, all, all the stuff. Just that the base should work, right? Yeah. This is probably stepping ahead, mm -hmm. but who decides the size of the block? I will specify it, but you can change it if you want. Okay. But it is specified at the time you write the program, right? And is the file that multiple? The size of the file multiple? The size of the block? It has to be, yeah. right? Because it's it's all. It's allocated as a block size, right? It's similar to what your Unix files are, right? It, it'll, it'll give you a file size which is different. You can, you can give it, if you write only two bytes, you could, if you have the right directory entry, you can say you only got two bytes. 
But the way the allocation goes, sort of like what we did for memory, you only get the block size, right? And of course, there's all kind of, you know, external fragmentation, internal fragmentation um, to deal with, right? So what makes it more interesting than what we did, you know, in the homework project, which is all simulation-based and you just get graphs and stuff, is to use the, the fuse mechanism, right? Which is a very easy way to write code. Essentially, this is how you, we will write uh, you know, disk drivers and stuff, and I'll show you in the next module. But essentially what you have is, you have a notion of a big structure which tells all the operations that this file system can do, right? So for example, file systems can do open, close, read, write, and a whole bunch of other operations, right? What Fuse lets you do is overwrite any of those for your particular file system. So you can write your own code for open, right? And and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll tell you how you do the mount and stuff. So once you do the stuff, essentially it'll look like a normal file system to the to to you as application uh, 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 user. Whenever you your application here calls open, your code gets to run rather than whatever file system do. And you are supposed to write the code to call. You know, if it's a file, you have to open the open the directory entry and find out where the file is and service those stuff, right? So you build this stuff, and there's a whole bunch of operations, you know, to create directories and all those things. For the base assignment, you don't have to do any of those. You can just do the open, create, read, write, and a few other calls that are necessary to do a basic functionality. But you can add stuff, you know, you can, you can create hierarchical directories or, or what have you. But this tool is, once you figure out how it works, it's fairly trivial to start doing stuff. So if you go to, Go search for Fuse. You know the, the, the project is called Fuse. There's a whole bunch of stuff people do, um, and it, it's fairly easy to do that, right? So to, to, to even make it clearer, next Friday I'll be gone. I'll be out of town. So the TA will be here, and he'll go through an example of how to use Fuse um, to, to, to you know how to use Fuse and stuff, right? So. Hopefully you should be able to do this without too much of effort. I mean, I think it's a very easy way to do that. And so I'll, I'll today, later on today, I'll send the um, homework project, you know, the, the, the instructions and stuff after I um, wipe out those, those machines, right? So if you have anything stored on the machines, um, there's never agreement that it'll be stored, but if you have something, let me know pretty soon so and, and copy it out, because otherwise it'll be gone, right? If it's on your home directory, it should still be there, but if you store it on any of the local hard drive, then it's probably gone, right? So talk to me after, uh, after the class, right? So we, we go to the, 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 la, the, la, the next module, the sort of the last module, which is the, the file system, right? File system is similar to the previous uh, memory, memory management system in lots of ways. You still have the same kind of issues. You still have this big chunk of something, in this case, disk storage. In the last case, it was memory, right? And you still have the hierarchy. You want to move stuff closer to memory than further out, right? The the one of the differences, this is slower, so you can do a lot more optimization, right? This is so much slower, you have time to do a lot more optimization, and they're probably worth it because you are now dealing with millisecond uh, speeds, you know, 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond to go and read something on the disk. So you could do a little bit more smarter stuff than what you what you are allowed to do for the memory because you're, then you're talking still faster, right? The other notion is disk, you expect them to be persistent, meaning when you store something on it, you expect them to stay forever. So if you mess up anything, then you're in trouble for a long time, right? So for example, in, the, in this case, if your free block was messed up, then you'll persist with you forever, right? For example, if you had a block which was free, but you marked it as being used, it'll stay like that forever, right? Unless you go back and clean out and stuff. But as the memory, if you reboot the machine, everything starts out fresh and all those things, right? For your project, it's not a big deal. So the ideal thing would be you build the stuff and you can actually store files onto this system, onto your, onto your file, and you can see how, you know, a good experiment would be to see if you trust your file system enough to store some important file, right? You should be able to, but um, you can try that, right? And so that, that's, that's a slight difference, you know, because it, it's very similar to the previous one. You still move stuff around to get speed, but now things are persistent and now, now things are, um, are, are relatively much slower, so you need to worry about those, right? 
And personally, for me, like storage is like is one of the is is one of the next big big frontiers kind of thing. You know. Um, so, for example, like the one of the that, that's part of my research and stuff. But for example, if the the video capture that we do for the class and everything, right? So, if if everybody in Notre Dame was to do the same thing, we would need 185 terabytes of storage per semester, right? Which is not that much, I would think, but um, it's not that much because you can you, you you should be able to buy a terabyte worth of hard disk pretty soon, right? That's 185 desktops in the near future, right? But that's still a lot, right? Because I think a few years back, whole humanity was creating 160 terabytes of information, I think 96 or something, right? So to me, that that is kind of exploding. But um, anyway, so today we'll, we'll look at the file systems and how they interface and all those things. And before we do that, I, I, I figured uh, I'll show a small piece of C code because I, I imagine many of you wrote code using um, fprintf and all those things, which are libraries built on top of the underlying file system code, right? So this is this is this is a very basic primer. It, it, it shows some of the stuff, and you know, you can do a lot more complicated stuff, right? So essentially, the open. So if you use the file, you know, file um, buffered I/O, you would call it fopen, fclose. F, you know, F, F read, F write, or F print of a scan of. The underlying system calls are open, write, read, close, right? And, and also uh, operation called seek, we'll see in the next few slides. So most of my examples are in C. You should be able to use with C++. Um, but if you go to Java or something, then it hides many of these uh, details, right? Um, and even for this project, you, it's probably better if you stay with C or C++. The fuse is available for Macs or FreeBSD or variants of Unixes. I don't think it's available for Windows. If you're using Windows, um, I don't know of any tool where you can do some of this stuff. So you may have to um, move to Linux, right? Linux or, or, or Unixes. Hopefully, it won't be too harsh. Um, and so open is very similar to your f open. So if, if, if you remember f open, you specify what mode you want to operate, uh, open the file as. You know, you say read, uh, read or read append, you know, r, r plus, w, w plus, right? Some of the operations you say. Here you say that in using a binary r operator, right? And there are a bunch of, bunch of uh, hash defines defined for you. For example, in this case, I'm opening the file called path, and path happens to be a file called file. Um, in the O underscore, so you look in the man pages to see what the different uh, options are, but O underscore WR only means it's write only. So yeah, I'm opening the file only for write, not, read is not allowed, right? And I'm doing a bitwise R of create, so all of them are true, right? And I want, it to, I want the file to be created, meaning if the file is not there, I will create it. And I want it to be trunc truncated. So if the file is there, it'll be truncated. Essentially, after I do this stuff, the file, if it's there, it'll be, it'll be wiped out and a new file is created. If the file is not there, you create a new file. Right? So at this point, I create a new file called file with zero bytes in it. Right? And the last 0660, 0660 is the mode in which I want to create the file, right? which you probably didn't do for fopen, which tells you what the permissions the file should be created as. Right? And we'll see permissions later on in the class. But essentially, it says this one says it gives you read-write permission. It gives you group read-write permission. The last zero is for others, and they, they get no permission, right? For now, just use that use that num number. At least use zero six zero zero, right? Which says that you get to read and modify. Right? The first six is the what you know what you can do, and you need the permission because if you don't give yourself permission, then everything else will fail, right? So the the, the next two calls write something. You know, it writes a hello and it hello writes a world. Right? This is not buffered, so when you say write, it, it goes onto the disk. You expect it to go to the disk. There's no, no, no notion of flushing or whatever. So I write hello and string length of hello to the disk to the file, and I write something and I close the file. Right? So it's a lot similar to what you've done, what you have done for uh, with the buffered I/O. Right? But you have to be aware that you know, things actually go to the disk right, right away. And, yeah, and it's a little bit more lower level than what you probably used to. Okay. 
So there's no notion of a string. So you know, if you do a get s or something when you do a high level stuff, you expect it to read a, up to a new line or something. Here you have to explicitly specify how many bytes you want to read, how many bytes you want to write. So if you think about it for your homework project, read block essentially is pretty trivial because you have to say read, go to the right where the offset is, and then read 512 bytes, right? It doesn't care what the content is, it'll give you the whatever exact data there is. So then I have two um, little stuff to show what are sequential reads and sequential writes, and we'll, we'll use them uh, later on in, in the lecture. Right. So essentially, I again open the file, right? I, since I closed it in the last, last, last page, I open the file. Now I'm opening it in read-write mode. So I, I can read and write the, the file. I don't have to specify the last bit because the file is already created. Right? So I don't have to set the mode because it's already set to whatever it was when it was created. So first I read four bytes. So I, I say read. The first argument is the file descriptor. The second argument is the buffer I want to read the data to. And the third argument is the count I want to read. Right? And of course, in a good program, you should check, check for error conditions. You should make sure that the file actually opens and all those things. And I'm not giving it here. So you read the stuff, and you can write it out. Right? So when you start a C program, File descriptor zero is standard in, right? File out, uh, so file descriptor zero is standard in, file out, uh, descriptor one is standard out, file descriptor two is standard error, right? So you don't get a chance to, to I mean, that's, that's given to you, right? So I can just write, write one, because I know file descriptor one is, Standard out, right? So that the second line says write whatever the first the four bytes I read to the standard output, right? So in this case, it'll write H E L L with no new line because I didn't write any new line or what what have you, right? And then I read the next four characters, which will be O R, and then it writes it and then close it, right? So this is a sequential read. I read from where I left off, I read four characters at a time, so I, I build the, um, that's how I get the output, right? So this is called sequential access because I'm, I'm reading sequentially, starting from the beginning, and I keep going, right? <coughs> so the, the next, next segment, I want to show how you can do random access, basically go and read wherever I want. So the, again, I open the file, you know, close the file, open the file again for um, read and, reading and writing. Right. So the, the, the first call we need to worry about is the seek, uh, lseek, right? which says that go directly jump into that particular location and start reading. So here I say lseek to 5, offset 5, and seek set. Seek set means, essentially means go exactly to that particular argument. So you should look at the man pages for lseek. There are three particular, three variants for seek. The first one is set, which says go to that location. I don't care where you are right now. Just go to five and then stay, stay there. Right. So when I do the read again in the next sentence, that means I start reading from. So I start reading from the W, right? The seek says start from here and reading for four. So the first read would return W O R L because it seek to that location, right? So in your in your project, when you do a when you have to read somewhere, you first read, seek to that location and then you start reading, right? And there are other different variants. So one of the other variants is the seek to end, which says go all the way to the end of the file, right? And from there, go to the offset I specify, right? So the last the, the next L seek says go to the end of the file, and then from there go forward 500 bytes, which is going beyond the end of file, right? So this way, you actually create a file with holes, right? You may not have been able to do this when you use fget or fread or, or what have you, right? So this means that if I think of the file as one long, like, sequential uh, thing, right? So we wrote. So we, we wrote till here, 
right? And we kind of assume this is the end of the file, right? <coughs> Which is how it was till we came to the point. But when I say else seek to end, so I seek to here, then I say seek forward 500, which means that it kind of goes, I assume this is a kind of infinite kind of thing, it goes to this 510, right? This is 10, right? So 510. So it seeks to this fictitious 510, and I wrote, haha, right? So, right? So this file now is, sort, I mean, you, you didn't have, so this is possible when you do a file, file write, right? So what happens is if you read this block, this entry, you'll get a zero, right? Even though you didn't write anything, but you'll get a zero. If you look at the file size, right, depending on how you look at it, if you look at the ls minus l, now it'll say the file size is 514, right? And if you do a ls minus s, it'll tell you, let's say, two blocks, right? It only allocates two blocks because it knows that you wrote something here, you know, wrote something here. This whole area is, uh, there's nothing here, right? So all it has to give you back is a zero, right? But it looks like you have the file, right? You might, you might have noticed it because you, you may have seen files which look a lot bigger, but still it doesn't take as much space from your system, right? And many of your, program, many of your like uh, PowerPoint and all, all those things could use some of these things to have a make, make a file look big, but not actually have, be that big, right? And I'll, I'll show you why you would use something like this from application perspective. Right. And it, this is really helpful because when you're, when you're doing this, this your, your, uh, your course project, you don't actually have to create a file and write something to start your program. Right? You, can, you can keep writing as you need them and things will be fine. Yeah. What happens if you see too far ahead, like if you put in, in like 5,000 instead of 500, could that cause an error? No. For the, for the right part? Yeah. No, you can, yeah, you can seek anywhere you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can go too far more than what the file system can support for a given file, then you should get some error, right? Which should be a very big number, right? Like some five terabytes or something, right? You shouldn't run into a problem on a 32-bit machine, but if you go to a 64-bit machine, so if your OS only allows your files to be as big as 500 bytes, then this will fail, right? Because it says you're trying to seek beyond what the file can support, but most modern files are so big that you shouldn't run into a problem. But you can actually go anywhere and write these things, right? And, and these are very useful when you're trying to write, develop your kind, of, your kind of application. You don't have to go through and write zeros to begin with. And you can you can write pointers and stuff, and I'll show uh, what that will be in a little bit. Yeah. Um, does seeking map directly to physical memory addresses? No. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, so it, it, it virtually goes into the file where it should be, right? Um, so all this fits into your, the, the stuff you looked in the previous section in terms of this could be in one memory block, the other stuff could be in another memory block, and they could be mapped <coughs> here. So in your file system, if you say, let's say your, your block size was 500, right? So this will be in first block, this will be in second block, right? Or let's say actually block size is 100, right? So this would be in block one, that will be in block five, right, or, or six, but you have nothing for two, three, four, four, five in the middle, right, because those are, this is actually a hole. But Unix will return you zero as if you wrote into it, but it's not allocated, it's not, it's not there, right. So these, these set of functions should be helpful for you to develop this, this piece of code. Right, the, the, this, the read block and write block, essentially if you think about it, is basically seeking to wherever you have to go and read that many blocks or write that many uh, objects. Right? In your case, we can't have infinite file because um, as a base you don't have to have infinite file, so you can actually say your disk is full. Um, but I'm giving you a lot more leverage in terms of what you want to do, how you deal with those things. Right? <coughs> I'm, I'm hoping that since you can actually interact with it, since you can actually write a file into your system and actually see how these things work, uh, you would want, this is one example where you can take it further rather than the memory simulator, which are more pedantic, not that much fun, right? 
So is, is that clear? So the, the, the TA will go through the uh, how to use fuse and stuff, but um, this level of you know C code should be enough for you to start with the actually finish your project. Right? You have lot more lot more um, concerns on how you would implement these things, right? So for for example, one of the question may be if you keep a free blocks in memory, how big should this free block size be, right? And obviously free blocks should be as big as your disk, right? But for the directory entry, how big should the directory entry be? That would be something that you have to worry about, right? Because if you if you allocate only 100 entries, a 100th one file would fail, right? Which is perfectly fine, but you have to worry about those when you design these things, right? And you have to worry about how to fill in these uh, stuff. So if, uh, let's assume you have a free block, right? And you want to allocate, you want to get a new block, right? Which means, uh, let, let's say you're, you're allocating this block, right? This is the conceptual free block uh, data structure, right? Which has to be stored on the, on the storage. And suppose you're allocating a first free block. How would you write it back on the disk? Remember, you only have two operations. One is read block and write block, right? So you can't go in and directly write here. You can't modify a substructure. You have to modify the whole block, right? You have to read the whole block, write the whole block. Does that make sense? So if you're trying to read byte offset 23, you can't seek into 23, right? You could seek it inside your read block and write block. But your whole file system can only read and write in blocks, right? So if you want to read 23, you have to read starting from 0 to 100 and throw away the rest, right? It will become more clearer as we move along, right? But essentially, you're only allowed to read and write in blocks, right? So if you want to man manage your structures, you have to read and write in a block. If you want to manage your directory entries, you have to read and write in a blocks, right? Which means that if you want to modify something, you have to read the whole block so you know what's around it, modify it, and then write it back, right? And and, and it'll, it'll, it'll become, I think, more clearer as we, as we proceed, right? So hopefully that'll give you a rough sense of you know what what these what these things are. Um, so we can use that knowledge to kind of go through the the rest of the stuff, right? So files, most of us know it's it's a, you expect it to be a contiguous set of bytes, um, and you expect it to be persistent, meaning when you write something into it, it'll stay, right? There are variants of this persistence, but for the most part, you assume that the the file would stay on on the system after your reboot, right? Um, you use it to store your programs and data. So that's that's the mechanism by which you keep something on the system. So it's useful for both uh, data and and for programs, right? So file systems can create files which has no notion of anything. So it can treat it as as this long array with, with no structure at all, right? Which is what Unix does and, and many systems tend to do. Or you can actually have structure, right? Where it knows something where you can say it's stored as records. It can look like a database, right? In, in fact, this is what Microsoft was trying to do for Vista using a file system called WinFS, right? Some of you may have heard about it. They were trying to create a file system where the file system knew of records and databases and all those things. So where it, it can where it can say, in this file, right, I'm going to create records which are, let's say, 12 bytes, right? And in the 12 bytes, the first, let's say the first four bytes are numbers, right? And the next eight bytes are characters, right? So you could be using it for storing a social security number or some number and your name, right? The file system itself can know those stuff. So the file system itself can, rather than giving read and write, you can ask for it for, I want to find the record whose number happens to be this, you know, sort of like what you do for a database kind of thing. And there's no reason why you can't do that inside the inside the file system, right? In fact, that's not a new idea. It was there in um, VMS machines in 70s and stuff, right? It's, it's history always repeats itself um, when we reinvent everything um, in a lot of context, right? So you could, you could, do, you could do that, right? So the, the, the files may have no notion at all. The, the, the file system may actually have this notion of what they are. But the file system may actually have a much more complicated notion of what things are, right? 
And it's always possible to, impl to implement these complicated structures using a base structure which, has, which knows nothing about it. That's what Unix tends to do. Right? In Unix, the files are, have no structure. It's all a byte, you know, a lo long array of bytes. But all your applications tend to give meaning to it. So if you write a PowerPoint file, PowerPoint file is not written as one long byte. PowerPoint file has meaning. It has some headers. It has some, it has some concepts, which the application deals with it. Right? You can have the OS do it, but for the most part, we do, we do it in the application. And the Microsoft Next Generation OS, you know, they, they would like to move it back to the OS. So operating system knows that this is a PowerPoint file. So it knows how it's stored. It knows a lot more about it, right? And we keep going back and forth, right? How many of you uh, are, have used Mac, Mac machines? So if you use Mac machines, so for some of you haven't used Mac machines. Right? So one of the things that you do with a Mac machine is, if you have a file, right, if you have an application, right, it looks like you see an icon which says PowerPoint, right? It looks like a one icon with one file, right? But internally, it's it's a whole bunch of stuff. If you actually go in and say show contents, you'll see it's a big directory structure, right? With different binaries, executables, and a um, whole bunch of different files, like PLS files and all those things, right? So it treats all this structure as one because they are conceptually they are the same, right? But and each of those files would be like like treated like this with a, a array of bytes, right? But no lot lot more structure, case lot more structure <laughs> because normal users don't have to know about it, right? But it's all there, right? So even though it looks like a, a document, it looks like a PowerPoint document, it looks like a you know, keynote document or something. It's not actually a document. It's a whole directory tree with a whole bunch of icons and all those things stored. Um, and that, that's, a, that's what it presents, right? And, and as you can imagine, if you're, when, you write your, when you write your programs, even in this case, right, it's not, it's not a bunch of bytes. You have a notion of blocks and everything, and it, that's all done in the application, right? So that, those are the different ways you can deal with the files. And here's a set of, I mean, this is in your book too. I'm not sure if you can read it, right? A bunch of different files and what they mean, and different operating systems figure this out through different ways, right? For example, you can use the extension, right? So within DOS or, or Windows, if you have a file with the .exe or .com or .bin, then they tend to be executables, right? Within Unix, if the mode bit says it's executable, then it's uh, executable. That means it's treated differently. It's treated however you treat executables for that particular uh, operating system. You specifically, you have you know, objects are Darto, and shell scripts are uh, so on and so forth. Um, so you know, if, you, if you have a file with extension .jpg, it can be treated as a JPEG image, even though nothing has to, I mean, it ha doesn't have to be a JPEG, right? So through different ways, you tell the system that this has some meaning. The OS may care about it, or it's just the application which cares about it. Either way, this is how you give more structure to it when the underlying system does not know about structure. Right? From, a, from a Unix perspective, all it cares is, is, a, is a string of bytes. It, could, it doesn't care whether it's an image or data or, or what have you. Right? But, but certain operating systems actually do enforce that. So in those operating systems, if it thinks it's a JPEG, you have to only operate on it through JPEG. Right? And some of these operating systems are sort of, sort of like a object-based systems, where if it's an image, there are only certain operations you can do on it. You know, it doesn't make sense to do a open read, write. You may have to display or, or what have you. Right? So within the file, the file has a lot of attributes. You know, some of the attributes. So you could implement these after attributes for your project, but we've seen most of them. You know, we have to have a name, notion of a name, right? Which is how you call the file. Which is what you use to open the file. Most file systems also demand the notion of identifier, which tells it, which is, which is the internal form that it knows, right? That's unique across that, that file system, which essentially denotes what the file is. So the unique identifier for a file may be one. You could call it something else, right? And, and because the name only means sense to you, you can have multiple names, but the unique identifier, there can only be one of those for the file system, right? And if your system supports it, you can have a notion of a type. Uh, you can have a lo you, you do have a notion of location, which tells you where in the uh, where in the disk it's stored, right? And uh, 
we will see how Unix does it and uh, how other systems do it. The size, right? And, and depending on how you calculate it, you can have different sizes stored there. The protection bits, sort of like what we saw with the 066, whatever, right? And depending on the operating system, it tells you who has access to read, write, execute, or do functions on the, on the particular file. And other metadata, like when it was created, when it was modified, when it was accessed, and um, who created it, who modified it, um, and, and, and so, so many other structures just as auditing information. Right? So these are the typical things you have with the file. And those are usually stored on the directory entries, and which identify what this file is. Right? We didn't have to keep many of this stuff for the pages, for the memory pages, because the only person who really cared about it was the operating system. Application asks for memory, OS has to give it to you. OS has to know how to access it, you know, the identifier. But that's about it. Nobody else need to, needed to know. And when the, when the machine crashed, or when the machine was shut down, all the structures can go away. Whereas here, everything has to be stored somewhere because, as you can imagine, um, these, these things are expected to be persistent, right? So here's an example of like how, what you might do. So if you do ls minus li, on, on, on Unixes, L shows you a long format, I shows you the I node, which is the unique identifier, right? So the, the first 26047823 is the identifier that the system knows, right? And the file that I know it as, like lecture like 22pt and it has other meta, meta information like uh, RWRR, meaning I can read, write, staff can read, and others can read, right? The group and uh, owner is surrender and staff, and the file size is five nine six four eight zero, and this is the time it has created, right? So these are, and, and you can play with these with these options to see a lot more information in your operating system. Within Macintosh, if you do, uh, you see something like this. It's, it's all the meta information for a file, right? So here it says, you know, the operations can be read, write, and, and so on and so forth. It, they are very similar, right? Yeah. Portable disk drives like my jump drive. How does the operating system assign unique identifiers to those files? Because so, yes, the okay. unique identifier is for based on a file system, right? And okay. I'll, so file system. So if you have a uh, uh, you know a, a, um, portable drive you bring in, so you'll have a file system for that portable drive. So I need to create a unique identifier within that file system, not across file systems, right? So in this case, you have to have something unique across what is in here, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't keep it unique across everything, right? Because you can move these hard disks, you can move this stuff around, so you keep it within the file system, right? Because it knows what file system it is. It knows it's in your jump, in a flash drive, so it has to say, within the flash drive, I want to access file one. And within the hard disk, I want to access file one, kind of thing. Right. And the operations you, you, you do on files, right? We, we saw some of those, you know, create. Create is the same as what I did with open, with the create uh, option, you know, home underscore create. But essentially, you, you want to have made to create a file, read, write, and reposition, seek, and, you know, seek delete a file, truncate a file, and so on, right? Truncate a file would say from this point on, the file doesn't exist anymore, right? And so if we, when you look at the open and, and closed system calls, open is sort of, you know, very high level, similar to what you do with a PCB, right? Open says, I want to operate on this file. So when I want to open, uh, operate an, open a file, you have to go through and figure out in a directory entry what file I'm talking about, right? Where it is. And I have to read some meta information about the file so I can proceed from that point. So when you do the read and write, the, the operating system knows what the file is and where, where things are, right? It also has to keep track of these file pointers which tell it where, where in the file that you are currently reading. Right? It has to maintain these structures and in a very superficial form, this is very similar to your PCB, right? That says, I know about this file, this is the state of the file. I mean, these are all the buffers I'm using, this is the dirty pages, whatever you can think of. Those all have to be done initialized when you start the open, and those all have to be cleared out when you do the close. When you do the close, it has to clean out all the structures. It also may have to keep track of how many users are opening the file when you do the open, and when you do the close, it has to do the corresponding uh, cleanup, right? 
So again, when you do the open, it has to initialize this open you know, some pointer and say where it, where it is. You have to read when you start to read after that point. Um, it keeps track of how many people have opened the file, and this is similar to the the notion of locking and stuff, right? So it has to keep track of how many people have opened the file, and and and, and we'll see what happens when you when you don't keep track of those. And caches and access rights, so it has to make sure that you have the access rights to open it and read it, and so so forth. Um, so again, you have the same notion of the memory pages and locking and stuff. You know, if you have two people operating on the same file, right? So files can be shared by multiple people, so two people are going to modify the same file. You have to have a mechanism to protect it, right? If you don't protect it, then the same kind of stuff that happens uh, with the memory pages could happen too. But in this case. It's possible sometimes for you to start operating on a file and go away, you know, the process dies, comes back, and then continue with what it was doing, right? Because the, the, the files itself are persistent on the disk, right? So in the case of the processes, if a process dies, then all the shared pages it had are kind of undefined, right? Whereas in the, in the files, it's all persistent. So locking may have to persist across the processes dying, right? So there are two kinds of locking. One is mandatory, one is advisory, right? Mandatory says that the OS will enforce the locking. So if you lock a file, nobody else will be able to read it uh, or do whatever other, other operations, right? Or you can have it advisory where if you're a good program, you lock the object, and your other good program should ask the system, is this particular block locked? If it is, then I won't do anything, right? Yeah. Um, would an example of advisory would be something that extends where two people open a file mm -hmm. and one person has read write access and the other one will only have read only access. Or? Yeah, other person would, would most likely also do read write. Okay. Right. If you do, if, if one person is doing read, other person is doing read write, then the other the read person cannot really do anything bad, right? Okay. Um, whereas if both of them are doing read write. So you don't actually try to lock the whole file. Right? If the file is rather large, you don't want to operate the, on the whole file. So you want to be able to lock chunks, right? So you, you want to say you are going to operate on you know section one to one you know one to one thousand, and second person is going to operate on three thousand to four thousand, right? So they lock three thousand to four thousand, zero to one thousand. So before you operate, you say did somebody else lock this location? And if they did, then I back off, right? Yeah. So is mandatory or advisory locking a property of the process Ah, uh, yes. So can you mix the two, or do you have to choose between one or the other? You can mix, mix and match. Okay. You can mix. I mean, you can say different chunks are different locks, right? Okay. So the reason why you have, why you don't always have mandatory locking, and why you have advisory locking, right? Unlike, unlike in the sum of force and all those things where. There's nothing which is adv advisory, right? If you, if you use some of those, it's either locked or unlocked. There's nothing uh, advisory about it, right? The reason is doing this on a file system is a lot harder when things become distributed, right? It's a lot trivial if you're doing it on one machine because in one machine, keeping track of this lock information is trivial, right? So if I'm, if I'm the operating system and this, this hard disk is local to me, then I, I can keep track of who's asking, who's, who's locking, and all those things, with the nice property that if I were to crash, all the processes also crash, right? If, if I had to shut down the machine, all of the machines shut down, so life is a lot easier that way, right? I don't have to worry about the case where I hold the lock, I made information about the lock, I as operating system, but if I crash, all my constituents also crash, right? So when they come back, I can keep track of who, who's holding the lock and all those things, right? Whereas in a distributed case, somebody has to keep track of who's locking what, right? And the machines can be in different states. So let's assume that you know I, I'm one of the hard disks, and another, another machine has one of the hard disks, and the lock manager is somebody over there, right? If I do mandatory locking, then if I can't talk to the lock manager, then I have to deny access to everybody. Right, <coughs> because I, I can't I can't verify whether somebody has locked it or not. Right, and if I crash, the mandatory lock cannot give to anybody because I may be holding on to the lock. When I come back, I have to do the stuff. Right, so if you're if you're talking about multiple independent machines, managing the locking is extremely hard. Right, 
You could do that, but essentially you'll go through periods when you can't get the log, so you can't proceed because somebody may have the log, right? So when you take the distributed system, distributed storage kind of class, you'll, that's a big thing you worry about. You have to weaken that constraint. You cannot say it has to be absolutely mandatory. You have to weaken it. In, so that's how um, your file system AFS, you know, the, the Nordian file system, it weakens it to a lot, lot, you know, so you have to understand what it does. It can't provide mandatory because if it does, things would be really slow, right? To give you a perspective, AFS is a, it's a global file system. So if you ever go to ls slash AFS, right, you'll see a whole bunch of other schools, right? So you can go from here to Stanford, Berkeley, whatever, right? All of, all of them, if they're in AFS, you can see any of the files, right? If you were to implement mandatory locking the way I defined it here, that means that if any of those machines go down, you could potentially not be able to access your file. So you have to use mandatory or, or much weaker stuff, right? And, and that's, that's the reason why you don't always do mandatory, even though mandatory seems like the way to go. But if you do that, your performance would be really awful, right? On a single machine, it doesn't matter. So for example, NFS, which is what the file server we use for uh, our lab, right? does not support locking, right? It supports mandatory locking. If you so choose, it doesn't support it. You can you can do something with it, right? And, and, and you know, I, I'll say a little bit about it if you have time, but essentially that's a different set of codes, I mean, uh, receiver systems, right? So, that, so that's the notion of locking. So again, you know, the, the access methods, we, 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 we saw the, the code example. One is the direct access and the other one is sequential access. Sequential access, you start from the beginning and you go to the end, right? You're allowed to seek, rewind back, right? But you're not allowed to um, randomly jump at some point, right? And sequential access makes a, lot, makes a lot more sense when you're thinking of devices such as tape, or you know, the, the old audio cassette kind of tape, right? where it, it keeps playing, or, or VCR tape, right? It keeps playing. So if you're at a certain position, you can continue to read from there, or you can rewind and start, right? You don't actually get to jump around the, all over the place. Plus, if you're doing a random access, you should be able to jump around. Your hard disks are random access. Your CDs are random access, because it can go from anywhere to anywhere. It doesn't have to rewind the whole stuff. And so that's how these mar access models came about. But you know they, they are also programmatically easier way, right? I, I bet most of you wrote code which wanted does sequential access, read and access before. Uh, seek is, is not as popular as a sequential read and write because they, they tend to be easier to kind of fathom. You can implement one or using the other. <coughs> Essentially, when you, when you talk about the sequential, you do a reset, which is a rewind operation, which means that seek to uh, zero, right? And read next is essentially I seek to the wherever current pointer is, and then I read from there, right? And right next would be I seek to the current pointer and then write, right? And move the current pointer, right? So you can you can implement uh, the direct using the direct access, the sequential access. Right. So I'll say a little bit about the directory structure, and we'll continue with this on the. Uh, on the next lecture. So directory is, is, the, is the one which keeps track of where the files are. It's, it's an index, it keeps track of what the files are. So if you think of the directory as this big cloud on the top and files at the, at the bottom half, directory keeps information of where the files are, right? So if you want to open a file, you have to go to the directory and search to see if the directory has an entry for the particular file you're, you want. And it'll tell you where the file is, it'll tell you where the pointer is on the disk or what have you. And and you operate on the file, right? So every open and close would have to go to the directory to do stuff. But once you opened it, you can you can keep track of where the where the pointer is. You don't have to look at the directory at all, right? Directory is the so that way directory is the index of where the, all the all the files are, right? And we'll we'll see in the next few slides uh, in, in when you come back in next uh, next class how these directories can be organized and how you search for them, right? So the, to give you a hint, directories can be flat. You know, there's one, only one directory. All the files are hanging around. Or it can be hierarchical, which is what you're used to, right? You create subdirectories and have different project names and all those things. Uh, so you can have one of those, right? And we'll just continue that on Monday. Again, if you have any files that need to be saved, let me know or it's gone, right?